This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney, with a foreword by Angela Davis. How Europe Underdeveloped Africa is an ambitious masterwork of political economy, detailing the impact of slavery and colonialism on the history of international capitalism. In this classic book, Rodney makes the unflinching case that African maldevelopment is not a natural feature of geography, but a direct product of imperial extraction from the continent, a practice that continues up into the present. Meticulously researched, how Europe underdeveloped Africa remains a relevant study for understanding the so-called great divergence between Africa and Europe, just as it remains a prescient resource for grasping the multiplication of global inequality today. In this new edition, Angela Davis offers a striking foreword to the book, exploring its lasting contributions to a revolutionary and feminist practice of anti-imperialism. How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney with a foreword by Angela Davis. Out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. If democracy is the proposition that the people should govern themselves, then who are the people and how should they govern? Since Donald Trump's election, however, establishment figures haven't been asking that question. Instead, they have been insisting that it is the people and their populism that pose a threat to democracy. The people's demands, they say, are incoherent, irrational, mean and dangerous, by which they often mean that they are dangerous to the status quo and to its norms and institutions. Don't get me wrong, Trump, of course, poses so many threats. But the threats that Trump poses, if we look behind his grotesque individual person and constant denigration of the establishment, are more often than not the extreme product of decades of Republican extremism and Democratic capitulation as usual. Trump did not invent the massive deportation machinery threatening immigrants, the Gilded Age level inequality threatening working class people, bellicose intervention on behalf of the Saudi-Israeli axis that threatens global peace and security, or a system of relentless fossil fuel combustion that threatens our survival on this earth. Far from it. And so what then to make of this populist moment? And how to distinguish populism's left and right variants? And how to make sense of Trump deploying a populist mobilization strategy in the service of a policy agenda that comprises the most extreme sort of business-as-usual Republican extremism imaginable? Last week in Boston, I recorded this interview with two experts on populism, political scientists Laura Gradin and Theoria Frankos. We discussed some of the questions that I just posed, as well as populism's history and the long-running, recently intensified debates over its meanings and possibilities. Before we get this started, please support the left-wing media you consume, in this case, of course, this podcast, at patreon.com slash the dig. Contribute $5 a month and you get access to our newsletter, the most recent issue of which is filmmaker, author, and activist Astra Taylor's Guide to Learning About Democracy. $10 and we'll ship you a copy of either a Jacobin's ABCs of Socialism or Assad Hader's Mistaken Identity. $20 or more a month and we will send you a bunch of left-wing books. In short, it's incredibly easy for you to be incredibly helpful to the DIG's long-term survival by making a contribution at patreon.com slash the DIG. That's P A T. R E O N dot com slash the dig. Thanks, and here's Laura Gradin and Thea Rio Francos. Laura Gradin is a professor of political science at Wellesley College and the author of Populism's Power 
Radical Grassroots Democracy in America from Oxford University Press. Her current research focuses on radical imagination and movements that are organizing to resist and abolish the carceral state. Thea N. Riofrancos is a professor of political science at Providence College. Her research focuses on resource extraction, radical democracy, social movements, and the left in Latin America, themes explored in her forthcoming book, Resource Radicals, From Petro-Nationalism to Post-Extractivism in Ecuador, from Duke University Press. Thea has also written two essays, and co-written one with me, about populism for N Plus One, which I'll link to in the show notes. Laura Gradin and Theoria Francos, welcome to The Dig. Thanks for having us. Thank you. My first question is a general one, which is, what is populism and why is it that we see both right and left populisms so powerfully emerging at this moment in the U.S. and Europe. So I think one of the things when we talk about populism is to remember that it's notoriously difficult to define, uh, whether you're in the media or in academia. And in part, that's because so few people call themselves populist. It's up to academics and pundits uh, to name something populist. And we see populism emerge across the ideological spectrum. We see it embodied in leaders and parties and movements. We see it on the right and on the left. So it's, it's difficult to get a grasp on. I like to think of populism as an antagonistic rhetorical strategy uh, and political strategy that pits a people against its enemy or adversary. And I think that uh, definition of populism can begin to capture some of the variety of populism that we see on the left and on the right. I think one of the things we also need to think about when we're defining populism is that it's deeply related related to democracy and in particular to what scholars call the paradox of democracy. So if we think about democracy, it's in simplest terms, the idea that the people rule themselves. And in modern times, that includes the notion of popular sovereignty. But if we want to think about the people ruling themselves, that includes an irresolvable tension on one level. It's a tension between the people and the institutions or the leaders who are supposed to rule them. But at an even deeper level, there is a tension within the people uh, themselves. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau said that the There's always a multitude within the people. Uh, Contemporary scholars like Jason Frank and Bonnie Honig talk about the people as being at once a constituted uh, group and a constituent power. So the people are constituted by discourses, by laws, by institutions that surround them. But they can also emerge to withdraw their authority from a regime and to reconstitute it. And I think we can think of populist moments as these kinds of constituent moments in which people are emerging amidst the paradoxes of democracy. So then I think we can see them uh, on both the right and the left today as people are reacting to the ecological and social and political and economic crises of our time. Thea, yeah. Is, what specifically is it about right now in this moment after the economic crisis in a crisis of the a late imperial crisis of the Western dominated global order that is so conducive to populism and so unfavorable to any politics that doesn't directly engage the people and their enemies, however those two are defined. Yeah, so I think that there's kind of two ways to address these that that question, and, and Laura brought up both of them, and, and I think that they're connected. So one reason that populism is a recurrent feature of representative democracy, and, and it's I just want to note right away that it's important to phrase it as as a feature and as an ongoing dynamic within representative democracy rather than something that is against democracy per se, right? And there are types of populisms that can be anti-democratic and some that can be emancipatory and, and quite democratic. So one reason that that populism is a recurrent feature of, of democracy, you know, since its 19th century representative origins is the way in which populism speaks to the central question of democracy of who are the people, who is the demos. And populism offers a a definition of the people or populist movements and and leaders and parties offer definitions of the people. And then kind of secondarily, which which Laura touched on, your question touches on, is that populism um, doesn't just recur because democracy says that the people rule, but it also recurs because crises and social conflicts 
open up the possibility of antagonistic relationships between the people and an enemy. That enemy could be defined in economic terms as an economic elite. It could be defined in nationalist terms as an internal or external other. It could be defined in racialized terms um, in all sorts of ways. But when there are moments of crisis, crisis, constitutional crisis, economic crisis, political crisis, crises of empire or of global warming, the political space opened for antagonistic articulations of the people and their enemies. I would just add to that, and I think this is a point that Thea has been bringing up um, quite a bit lately, is that in these moments of crises that we're seeing today on on many levels, that liberal institutions are ill-equipped to respond to them. And they're ill-equipped to respond to them in part because liberal institutions are captured by some of the very forces that are responsible for the crises of our day, a corporate capture, mergers with neoliberalism, militarism, and the like. And also because liberal institutions and norms are uh, ill-equipped to capture the anger and the sentiment and the passion and the vision of people who feel uh, disenchanted from politics. And so the very liberal institutions that we're supposed to rely on to address the problems around us are quite anemic in response to the popular mobilizations that are coming up on both the right and the left. Laura, your book in part focuses on the right and left populisms that emerged in the wake of the economic crisis, the Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street. And obviously, you couldn't have known it at the time, but those two movements respectively lay the groundwork for Donald Trump on the right and Bernie Sanders and other things on the left. Explain why both of these movements count as populist, though in very different ways, and how they have shaped left and right populism in the U.S. as they exist today. Sure. That's a very, very large question. (laughs) Explain the last eight years of American history, please. Sure. Here we go. So I think that if you look at the Tea Party and Occupy as twin responses, though uh, twins on the opposite side of a coin, uh, to the economic recession, we see them as responding to a crisis, but with a different understanding of who is being harmed, who the people are that are being harmed, who the enemy is that needs to be mobilized against, and what measures need to be taken uh, to either restore or transform democracy. So just starting with the Tea Party, you you, you can think about it as uh, maybe the culmination of what we might call neoliberal populism, right, Uh, where the people as individuals are revolting against the state. And if we think about it that way, uh, the Tea Party has its roots in the kind of merger of capitalism and social conservatism under under Nixon and Reagan, right? Um, so sort of a tax revolt populism. The, the tax revolt populism, right. And if you think about it, the Tea Party offers this fantasy of individualism, a uh, fantasy of individual rights and freedoms, but it's circumscribed by these very familiar reactionary cultural discourses that have always been a part of uh, conservative right-wing populisms. And conti- in and particular, this notion that there are individuals uh, against the kind of not just the government, but also undeserving or so-called dependent classes. So if you think about you can even look back further, if you think about the ways in which right wing populism existed before the Reagan and Nixon eras, you can see that the Father Coughlin's and the George Wallace's, they were certainly kind of stoking white resentment um, and, and a kind of social conservatism. But there was also an anti-corporate rhetoric. Right. Once you get to Nixon and Reagan, you see this kind of alignment of reactionary cultural narratives and a kind of capitalist ideology. So, for example, the the silent majority under Nixon was the notion that individuals should shoulder the burden uh, or should not have to shoulder the burden of social and uh, economic reforms in the 60s and the kind of um, Johnson era. And if you think about the Christian right, uh, you're getting language like uh, behind the anti-tax and spend sort of uh, policies like thou shalt not steal, right? So there's kind of justification for anti-tax and spend policies through this kind of religious language. So it's important to think about this because if if we look at the Tea Party as a kind of uh, libertarian populism or neoliberal populism, we also see that it's circumscribed by these traditions of um, of, uh, producerism or white social democracy. So we see there being a kind of freedom and benefits for those who work hard, hard taxpaying, hardworking Americans uh, that necessitate a denial of resources to undeserving and so-called dependent classes. So the Tea Party doesn't take off without a kind of racial resentment that happened under Obama. And you can see that uh, Obama comes in as the first black president. He has an ambitious governmental response uh, to the economic crisis. And then he sort of takes on or personifies that familiar 
familiar right wing uh, discourse that brings together big government overreach with um, racialized and gendered anxieties against the kind of dependent uh, classes that, that we see um, uh, in the Tea Party. And if you think about the Tea Party bringing its way to Trump, the, you can remember that Trump, of course, played a big role in the rise of the Tea Party, right? The kind of racist resentment against Obama. Um, uh, the citizenship the, the citizenship and birtherism yeah. kinds of investigations, right? But then you don't get a Trump election without the Tea Party. So the Tea Party brought congressional alignment and redistricting. Uh, local Tea Party groups became the front uh, wave of some of the voter suppression uh, acts and policies that enabled Trump to get elected in the first place. And of course, the Tea Party brought with it a kind of acceptance, a growing public acceptance of white masculinist rhetoric and spectacle before Trump even came to power. And, and that aspect stays the same from the Tea Party to Trump. But then there is this 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 shift in, somewhat in the rhetoric between this kind of libertarianism of the Tea Party movement and Ayn Rand idolization to this kind of working class anti-globalist, anti-Wall Street thing, which then Trump mobilizes in on behalf of a business as usual Republican extreme missed business agenda but but th- but there is some kind of weird shift that happens at least rhetorically I think that's right I think I mean I think one of the points I was trying to make earlier is that the Tea Party itself merged this libertarian sort of um, Ayn Randian rhetoric with a socially conservative vision of which people deserve government benefits get your government hands off my Medicaid suggests that those who are hardworking taxpaying Americans deserve government uh, support even as they also see a need to dramatically cut uh, public resources from other people who they see as undeserving right So that was always there. I think one of the things that Trump does, too, is then he personifies this businessman as hero, the people's businessman as hero, which also became popular from the Reagan revolution, right, even through the Tea Party and beyond. So in some ways, he's carrying on that notion that, um, you know, this this entrepreneur becomes the kind of paradigm of what democracy is. While at the same time, and I think this is what you're you're trying to get at, he's taking a page book from the earlier 20th century populisms on the right that bring that kind of protectionist um, uh, mentality to stay, to stay um, have that kind of strong man feel that you get with Father Conklin or, or George Wallace. And so he's able to do that in order to, um, uh, you know, mobilize this um, that's the kind of tricky thing that on the one hand he's he's using the the kind of businessman as hero on the other hand he's using the kind of strong arm politics of earlier right wing conservative populism a kind of protectionism to bring effective identification right and his closing um, and passion, ad attacks right? Goldman Sachs you know viciously. and in a kind of yeah. anti corporate rhetoric yeah. right and then bringing into place some of the very policies that Tea Partiers wanted in the first place right which is no taxes on uh, you know businesses and the like. So how should we make sense of the idea that that Trump is able to use this populist mobilization strategy to advance what, with some exceptions, like namely trade, is trade war with China and a few other things uh, like foreign policy and I don't know. But mostly it's a populist mobilization strategy to advance business as usual Republican extremism. Mitt Romney recently wrote – uh, that many of Trump's policies are great, but he falls short in, mm. quote, presidential leadership in qualities of character. Since he's getting the job done as far as Republican policy priorities are concerned, has the Republican Party, aside from some dissent on foreign policy and trade policy, learned to embrace populism? How do we make sense of this convergence? I mean, I think one thing that that occurs to me is is exactly in in the way that you frame the question that this is a strategy and and in some part a rhetorical strategy of of Trump's, and that's not to downplay the power of rhetoric or discourse politically, but just to say that I think it is a mistake to see Trump as a phenomena as a populist movement, in the sense that he he is a leader that has, I think, in some ways skillfully, uh, whether intentionally or not, deployed uh, right wing populist uh, tropes of the long history in American politics, as Laura just laid out. But he's not part of a movement that can hold him accountable, exactly. Even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, well, he does have accountability in one sense, which is kind of in Weber's sense of charisma, right? So he cares a bit about his audience, and he cares about the audience dynamic of saying things on stage that are going to resonate and are going to get applause or booze or whatever you know he's trying to elicit. So in that sense, there is a moment of accountability that takes place in, this, in the spectatorship sense, but he doesn't have an internal organization 
organizational dynamic in which followers of his movement can hold him accountable for the fact that he says one thing and um, putting trade aside basically does another thing. I mean, I think in the trade question, he is pursuing, you know, an isolationist path. But aside from that, in terms of just the basic parameters of Republican policy, he's hewing to the line, um, even as his rhetoric might diverge from what, you know, was the sort of um, Republican rhetorical strategy prior to him. But so my, my point is that I think that if he were part of an organization in which his base or followers could hold him to account in some way and were empowered to hold him to account, they might hold him to account for not really doing what he says he's going to do, which is benefit the, quote, working class or even benefit farmers in, you know, in the Midwest, which are now reeling from a number of his policy changes. Um, And I think that, you know, this is something we might get into later, but that's something that distinguishes emancipatory, liberatory, grassroots forms of populism from this neoliberal populism, which is that there is no internal organizational dynamic in which the base or the, the sort of grassroots, the bottom up piece of it can hold leaders to account um, on their promises. I think that accountability piece is key. And I think that helps answer a question of a Trump who's performing one thing while promising another. I think there is also a suspicion that we ought to have around the idea of a, of a, of a right that has become fully anti-corporate, right? Um, and I think even if we look at the Tea Party, there were moments of anti-corporate uh, sentiment, even as many Tea Partiers were some of the most conservative Republicans from the Republican base for decades, who also had promoted the Republican policies on taxation, on business, and the like. And so I think there is something deeper in the populist tradition on the right or the populist uh, rhetoric on the right that allows for a kind of merging of populist mobilizations of the people against government, even as government isn't necessarily going to work for the people, if we consider the kinds of policies that Republicans have been going for. And I think I think Trump follows on a Tea Party that brought the Republicans to the right on that with a base um, that was not only AstroTurf, but that was also significantly grassroots. Uh, Laura, circling back, we have Occupy's 99% and Bernie's political revolution. What were the, the people as construed in these two different instances, who 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 are these movements demos, and how does the way that Occupy and Bernie defined the people lead to a very different sort of populism than the Tea Party? Sure, I think you see the Occupy rhetoric of the ninety nine percent versus the one percent spanning its debts to kind of historical populisms in the U.S. dating back to the 19th century that brought the people against the oligarchy or against the money power and moving us forward to Bernie Sanders, which brought the people against the economic and political oligarchy in the United States. And so there's there's an economic populism that has been on the left and remained consistent on the left uh, throughout its resurgence and emergences in United States history. I think one of the things about those ideas of the people is that they're a kind of flexible model of what the people might be. The 99% or the people's revolution under Bernie can conceivably and did try to incorporate not only uh, working class men and women, um, unions, anti-racist organizers, feminists, uh, queer folks, and others, e- ecological, environmental activists who really tried to come together in both movements and understand what the 99% might be and what the problem was with the current uh, state or the current establishment that brings together ecological white supremacist, gendered, and other kinds of issues. And so I think that there's more ability within the left populisms that we're talking about from Occupy to Bernie for a kind of contestation within who the people are, right? The ability to recognize, as happened with Occupy and Bernie, uh, those moments when a kind of white narrative or white masculine narrative or a middle class narrative was taking over and um, obscuring some of the other actors and players who were central to both movements. And in particular, you can see with Bernie in the way that the fight for 15 and other um, you know, immigrant women, black women, uh, food service workers were central to his movement and were able to find their voice and bring their voice into it. And I remember the response on social media when I believe Hawaii was described by some media outlet as Bernie winning another overwhelmingly white state. And there was this huge response of Bernie made me white of all of these Bernie supporters who felt of color, who felt like they'd been ridden out of the the Bernie bro kind of icon. Exactly. Even as that was a real issue, there was a kind of Bernie would not have happened without Occupy, certainly, but also not without the fight for 15, without people who are working in the trenches in their communities before that 
for living wages, without the immigrant rights movement, even in many ways without the movement for black lives, right? It wouldn't have been possible that, that he had emerged in that way. Well, this touches on a debate, a recurring and intense debate on the left, which is that the way kind of really maximally universalizing conceptions of the people, like the 99%, like the implied people of the political revolution, on one level, it's maximally inclusive, but to such an extent that it's homogenizing and flattening and even exclusionary. How do you see the left thinking of and building a people that is both maximally inclusive, but inclusive of difference as well. I agree that sort of a key tension within the figure of the 99% is that it's on the one hand, maximally inclusive, as you put it, but on the other hand, or by that same token, might have these homogenizing tendencies that paper over the realities of sexual, racial, immigrant status, forms of oppression, um, and other forms of social oppression. And within class. Oh, excuse me? And within class. And within class, class. right, right, because we're targeting the 1% and anyone below that, which could, you know, include the middle class, uh, lower middle class, the working poor, you know, all sorts of folks uh, with, with different class statuses. I think that whether or not the 99% as a, as a figure of emancipatory populism is homogenizing in the bad sense or in radically inclusive in the good sense, that's an open and empirical question, I would say, or and a political question. And what I mean by that is, I can see hypothetically and, and, and in histories moments when leaders interpolate a broad, a broad vision of the people as kind of a monolith, right? And then we get some of the dangers of, well, is this papering over oppression that divides people or maybe leading to, to kind of not addressing those, those oppressions um, that, that should be dealt with? I think that if the 99% is composed through bottom-up horizontal articulations between groups that enter into relations of solidarity with one another as an intentional political practice and forge alliances that both involve empathy across difference, but also involve the expansion of the sense of what the shared interest is. And those two things can happen simultaneously or, or, or be distinct depending, depending on the context. But that involve empathy, solidarity, and the sort of the expansion of a sense of who the shared interest is and who the we is. And if that happens kind of in a stepwise fashion through the sort of gritty politics of everyday organizing, That is something that can, that is a process that can expand the we without involving homogenization, but with involving the articulation of shared interests or overlapping interests in a heterogeneous block. And I think those are two different processes, and I've just laid them out to be, you know, kind of black and white, totally different from one another. Obviously, any real life practice might involve both top down and bottom up, both homogenizing and inclusionary tendencies. But I think just like putting them forward as ideal types um, kind of clarifies that that those, I think, are where the the both the dangers and the the radical possibilities come from with a with a figure like the 99 percent. Laura? Yeah. And I would add to that. I mean, I think I think that's absolutely right. And I think that when we think about populism emerging from this paradox of democracy or paradox of the people, we have to remember that every articulation of the people is going to have its closures and erasures, right? There is never going to be a line between the people and its enemy or adversary that doesn't exclude not only the enemy or adversary, but also uh, what Ernesto LeClau calls the heterogeneous excess, right? And that's folks who don't necessarily find their voice within, aren't legible within, or sometimes refuse representation by uh, whatever the version of the people is, right? Or if you look at something like the people's revolution, right, that is a wonderful phrase to capture not only uh, a notion of multiple coalitional actors from different movements and organizing struggles engaged in trying to elect Bernie Sanders, not for the sake of Bernie Sanders, but for the sake of having their various different heterogeneous interests Uh, represented in politics. But you can also see the ways in which even something like the People's Revolution gets written over by Bernie's insistence on using a kind of race-neutral language of uh, economic grievance and and working class uh, status, right? And so in that case, I think it takes within left populist movements, right, an effort to think about the kind of narratives we're telling, the kind of practices we're engaging in. I think you mentioned empathy, right? You can think about listening, right? I think you can also think about the need for disruption within movements 
themselves. Now, that's a difficult kind of organizing strategy because you're trying to organize and, 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 and win, uh, you know, uh, an election or, or, or on an issue, right? And yet I think what we see with people of color and queer affinity groups in Occupy, with the Movement for Black Lives and Bernie, is that effort to say, our concerns, our issues aren't being represented within the terms of the people's revolution in this moment or within the terms of the 99%, right? And I think for left populist movements cultivating solidarity, an effort to not balk at that, right, which some folks in the Bernie camp did and Bernie himself did at first, right, but to listen and respond, right, that there needs to be that kind of practice built into left populist movements to build the kind of solidarity you're talking about. Right. And and to always sort of take the the position that any challenge within the 99 percent, if sort of addressed in sincere terms, is something that is going to strengthen us politically, right? It is not, you know, the, the disruption is something that if then we have a conversation and then we figure out how to re- change our organizing strategy so that we are building a multiracial working class movement, that's something that's going to strengthen the 99 percent. It's not a weakness to respond to critique. That's absolutely right. If the emancipatory potential of populism is to bring out people, everyday people, people who have been rejected by the establishment and and show and organize their voice in politics, then their emancipatory potential has to include those efforts to bring out those who are at the margins of their own visions. And that all requires being able to distinguish between opportunistic and cynical cynical attacks on purportedly identitarian grounds launched by the neoliberal center and substantive critiques coming from social movements. Thea, you have written that, quote, since Donald Trump's election to the presidency, a steady stream of concern pieces has appeared across the national press, warning that American democracy faces a threat like never before. We have seen the same after Brexit and with the rise of the new European right. What does it reveal about the American political established and established American institutions that it was seemingly only with Trump's election that democracy, given its track record, was finally considered to be in crisis? Right. Well, I think, first of all, uh, as, as your question suggests, it, it um, implies a profound amnesia about the past and a profound isolation from the myriad crises of the present, right? So to to imagine that democracy was always fine and inclusive and tolerant and good for most people in America is is an intentional and a willful forgetting of what American the American political and social order has been like for most ordinary people um, in the US since its bloody founding. And it also um, by by sort of framing populism as an attack on American democracy and a good American democracy that's always been good. It refuses to address the real crises that are coming to a head um, and that we mentioned earlier, economic, political, ecological crises that do need to be addressed. And maybe, as, as Laura suggested earlier about liberal institutions, can't be addressed within the confines of the bipartisan consensus or sort of the norms and institutions that are invoked in defense of the American order. So that that's sort of one one thing that it reveals. Um, so I think another another way to think about this, in addition to the the amnesia and the kind of inability to respond to the deep crises of our, our present moment, is it's interesting to shape over time in the past few years how the liberal establishment has shifted in its framing of populism. So initially, even before Trump was inaugurated, but after he was after he won the primaries and then after he was elected, there was this constant and very annoying conflation of left and right populism. Like there are these two threats to American democracy. One is Sanders. The other is Trump. Right. (laughs) One is Occupy. One is the Tea Party. Right. Exactly. Pretty much the same problem. (laughs) Right. You know. Right. Exactly. And so there there are a number of kind of obvious problems with that and that it flattens ideological difference. Um, It also flattens the really real social sociological differences between the different constituencies of these different populisms. It also flattens the fact that these populisms, left and right, have often been in explicit antagonistic conflict with one another when they've emerged at historical, at shared historical junctures. So it it says it does a disservice um, um, to history and how we ought to understand politics. That kind of shifted over time. And what we've gotten more recently is an even worse framing of populism, which doesn't conflate left and right 
and doesn't even refer to left and right explicitly, but rather defines populism as authoritarian xenophobia. So basically, any time that the word populism is used in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or wherever of the establishment press, it, by context, implicitly refers to reactionary, xenophobic, and demagogic sort of authoritarian this leaders. This term, populist parties, to exactly. mean the European New Right. Exactly. And so that, that does a couple of things. First, it really lowers the threshold for what counts as populism, because basically a leader just has to say something xenophobic and they are all of a sudden a populist and inserted into this long history of populism. So that that's just kind of weird kind of categorically or conceptually to use that as the litmus test for whether someone is a populist or not. But second of all, I think it performs a couple of ideological moves and political work for the liberal establishment. By associating populism with xenophobia, it simultaneously exculpates the complicity of the liberal establishment in a long history of xenophobic policies, anti-immigrant policies, border security policies, all sorts of policies that were the bipartisan consensus until they got associated with Trump recently. So it performs that labor. And the second political labor that it performs is allowing the establishment to not respond to the left critique, to the left populist grievances and demands about inequality, about oppression, about real democratization. And so by associating populism with the right, the liberal establishment both kind of steps away with clean hands from um, all of the xenophobic and carceral policies that it's helped create. And it also refuses to respond to the real left populist critique of of liberal institutions and how they've been captured by neoliberalism and um, how they also don't represent um, real democracy in any sense of the word. I think if you add to that too, then just kind of by default, it's easy to see something like the movement for black lives or immigrant rights organizing, anti-deportation organizing as distinct kinds of grievances from, um, you know, from subjects at the margins as opposed to a united block of the people against government, right? And so there's a kind of strategy there. I think it's important to, to as, as, you're, as you're talking about this history, I, I, I almost think that the establishment has responded to populism differently depending on what it sees as a threat, right? So I think that if you look at the period of Occupy and the Tea Party, um, if you look at the success of Bernie Sanders in the primaries, there was a real sense of, uh, wow, people are mobilizing on all sides against the establishment, and there's a threat there that might allow for that narrative. If you look at the Cold War consensus you've been writing about, right, um, in the 50s, and you look at the way that populism was talked about then, uh, you see something actually quite similar. So you have folks like Richard Hofstadter, uh, Daniel Bell, Seymour Mar- Martin Lipset, who are writing about right-wing populism, mostly, not acknowledging their own uh, debts to a populist movement, the New Deal, right? <laughs> and so you see Richard Hofstadter, when he writes The uh, the Age of Reform, he's talking about 19th century populism, uh, and then using that to kind of, and he, he paints that as a kind of reactionary and anti-Semitic uh, mobilization against, you know, against capitalist modernization, right? And he's contrasting his preferred form of liberalism, kind of liberal pluralism, as a kind of interest group politics within established institutions. And he contrasts that both to what he sees as this kind of reactionary populism that he largely puts on the right, on the one hand, and the antagonistic politics of class conflict, which he thinks never immigrated from the new world, or from the old world, sorry, to the new world, right? So it's another kind of moment in which there's an effort to bring a kind of liberal center or pluralist center as the kind of norm uh, by denigrating both right-wing populists and a left that he refuses to avow or see in the United States. Absolutely. And I think another thing that that reveals is the way that liberalism also requires closures and erasers, right? To use your, your phrasing, which I liked a lot from before, which is that liberalism, if it's going to exist in a democratic context, also needs figures of the people. Figures of the people, whether implicit or explicit, also require figurations of the other or the enemy or the non-people, right? And liberalism is not innocent of that. And I think that if we look at what types of people liberalism has constructed and relied upon to legitimate its own order of limited democracy and economic inequality, then we actually are going to see some kind of uncomfortable resemblances, I think, between 
liberal figurations of the people and actually, I would argue, revanchist right wing figurations of the people. I'm not equating them, but I think there's uncomfortable there's uncomfortable affinities between them, which I think to get a little psychoanalytic maybe is part of what liberals are reacting to against the xenophobic threat, which is not just that they see it as a threat to their power, like we're going to be replaced by this xenophobic party, but also because they've seen the xenophobic party, the monster that they have created through their own nationalist um, figurations of the people. Yeah, Laura, on that right. note, you write, uh, quote, state policies that contribute to the precarity of marginalized groups gain legitimacy by making symbolic enemies of some part of the people. So it's not just populists who require a demos, who require a people. Centrist liberals, liberals like Bill Clinton also had a people, and the results haven't been been pretty. What? Who? Who was the neoliberal people of of the '90s Clintonism? I think that's great. I mean, I think you move from the kind of liberal pluralism of the Cold War era to the liberal multiculturalism that's embodied in Bill Clinton. Um, you know, the guy who is going to be the first president to accept gay folks until he didn't, right? Um, the first black president, quote unquote, right? And so there is that kind of idea of a multicultural creedal people, right? Uh, people who share certain values embodied in the creed, um, liberty, uh, mobility, certainly respect for rights and fairness and these kinds of things, right? And yet that gets cast against in in Clinton era, um, those folks who are threatening the order that makes that possible. And here we can think of the dramatic rise of the carceral state, right? Um, so the language around, um, and, and of course, the, the reduction of, of, of the welfare state, right? So you have, again, there is a reliance on this notion of um, criminal classes, dependent and undeserving classes that allow for, so for example, welfare queens or um, the notion of the super predator that, 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 that Hillary uh, loved, loved to give us. Um, that allow for neoliberal policies and neoliberal security state to emerge against the threats to the most the rest of us, right? And I think you can see maybe a broader vision um, in Clinton era policies of who people are than in Trump era policies, right? Um, there is an appeal to this kind of multicultural center, and yet you can only have that, and you can only protect it by creating a kind of car- carceral apparatus against those who are deemed threatening. And we see that currently, um, I'm kind of recurrently coming back to haunt us now with these sort of so called left wing or progressive or liberal reappropriations of nationalism and of patriotism that Yasha Munk, that Peter Beinart, that Mark Lilla, that, you know, other kind of op-ed pundits are are invoking um, in their opinion pieces, which is that the left in response, the left, quote unquote, because I don't really think they're talking about the left, but whatever, the left should in response to someone like Trump have a left-wing version or progressive version of nationalism. But then the question immediately becomes who is included and who is excluded in that in that nation. And one other thing I'd, I'd note is that this kind of problem that liberalism has with designating who the people are and its recourse to nationalism or to producerism or to taxpaying citizens or whatever it is that we might kind of more readily associate with the right is a problem that happens on the level of theory as well, not not just in, in or, or in addition to political practice. In of liberal democracy, democratic theory, there's this constant kind of search for who are the people that are um, are the collective subject of democracy. Since liberal institutions and norms can't generate the people themselves, the people has to be pre- presupposed by them. So there's often, again, like a recourse to the nation to shared, quote unquote, civic culture, to tropes like this, which have pretty obvious homogenizing and exclusionary kind of dynamics built into them. I think that's right. Um, you mentioned Mark Lola, right? And there's that again, that moment in which you have a you know a, a, a liberal establishment thinker who critiques the Bernie campaign and others for a kind of identity politics, right? So then again, reducing any leftist cr- complaints to a kind of identitarian status concerns rather than the kinds of structural concerns we're seeing raised by anti deportation movement for Black Lives folks, um, Me Too movement, and the like. Laura, you write that. Liberal critics tend to denigrate populism as always attempting to eliminate or transcend, quote, mediating institutions of representative government. For example, individual rights, minority protections, deliberative procedures, and separation of powers. Uh, You write, quote, liberalism's party line on populism treats it as an empty or absurd but potentially dangerous wish. That is an illusion of popular democracy that all too often turns the people against democracy. 
who do liberals think the people are and how do they think that the people should exercise power in a democratic government? And then how should left populists think about institutions, given that entirely unmediated total direct democracy is obviously impossible and also, I would say, undesirable? Because if the people in government do become conceived as one, then dissent against government becomes dissent against the people, and that's never good. So I think you can think about liberalism's views of the people, and this I think just uh, maybe expands on some of what Thea was mentioning, as a little bit conflicted, confused, and intention, right? So on the one hand, there's a historical anxiety around the people from Locke through even Rousseau, who was an advocate of the people, certainly through the Federalists, right? And then into the, you know, the kind of 1950s liberals and the like, right? The people is mob rule. Um, the people can't be trusted. They're fickle. Tyranny of the majority. Tyranny of the majority, right, exactly, right. right? So there's this anxiety about a collective act. Even as, as Thea noted, liberals have had to rely on popular sovereignty to legitimate the very institutions that they're trying to put in place, right? Um, minority rights, procedures, deliberation, uh, and, and the like, right? So on the one hand, you have this kind of anxiety about the people. And then that often leads to a, a rather anemic view of the people or popular sovereignty, right? Um, so William Riker in Liberalism Against Populism says there is no people. It's just individuals who aggregate, right, their votes. And that's in many cases what liberalism wants, right? It wants to take that there is no society. <laughs> there is no society, exactly, right? Um, they they, they want to take that legitimating function that the people have given to modern democracy and then attenuate any role that the people might have. And you see that back in the ways in which Madison is writing about uh, representative government as kind of con- checking and constraining the passions of the people, right? And you certainly see it in the varieties of ways in which people are encouraged to be apathetic and, and, and left out of politics today, right? So I think in, in, re- in the first part response to the question, I think you get this kind of confusion among liberals between between the people as mob, the people as just individual and attenuated, or in more robust versions like Thea's talking about, this notion of a people who might be held together by shared norms, uh, mores, habits of the heart, um, deliberative processes and the like, right? Where then you have to still be kind of relatively um, reasonable, civil. Um, you might be able to show love, but it has to be a kind of patriotic love for country, right? Not um, love for black lives, for example. So I think that's kind of the, the potentially answer to the first part of the question. The second part of the question, uh, who, do liberal th- who do liberals think the people are? There's also this kind of anti-statism and anti-institutionalism in liberal views of the people. So the anxiety about the people in mob rule is that there's going to be a kind of obstruction of uh, democratic institutions from representation to uh, laws and policies and the like, right? And that goes back to liberal views of populism or of popular politics that go back to a kind of Rousseauian version of the people or to Carl Schmitt, um, who had a wonderful critique of liberal institutionalism and who then posited, however, that what democracy is, is an immediate uh, uh, identity between the people and the one who rules, right? So there's this kind of Caesarist or personalist or charismatic notion um, of the people trying to bypass institutions and just work through strong leaders or through their own democratic or, or demotic will, right? And that's anxious. That's an anxious kind of thing for liberals. That's not what populist movements have done. That's not what populist movements did on the right. Uh, when they radically created a re- religious public sphere out of a secular public sphere, they used laws, they used policies, right? They changed strategically what the Supreme Court was going to look like, and that continued over time, right? Um, that's not. So it's not eliminating these mediating institutions; it's just doing things that liberals don't like with them. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and if, you know, if you think that certainly for every time that the Tea Party obstructed a democratic uh, process in the House, right, they also learned how to, to, to pass bills at the local level, and they got people elected, right? Um, the, you know, the, exactly the kind of baseline of what democratic particip- participation might look like in a, in, a, in a local government. And then if you look at more robust, um, you know, versions of populism uh, that have also been seen as anti-institutional, and you can look back to 19th century populism, you could probably look to the New Deal, um, you can to what uh, Bernie Sanders and the post-Bernie folks are, are trying to do. There's certainly an effort to create institutions within populist organizing, right? So from cooperative uh, movements um, and institutions of the 19th century populists to entire new political parties, um, to forms of electoral politics, including referenda and recall, um, to experimenting with boycott as a politics of refusal of institutions in order to inaugurate new ones. There's a whole kind of experimentation with what alternative institutions and relationships to them should be. And that's dismissed when we think of populism as something that's just rhetoric um, or as something that's just about immediacy and not as a kind of organizing strategy as Thea brought up earlier. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, what Laura's work and and my own research on on Latin America kind of makes incredibly clear is that across the Americas, all of these experiments in populism, both left and and right, but I'm particularly interested in in the populisms on on the left, is a very rich organizational history of both creating new parallel institutions, sometimes explicitly of dual power, kind of against the state, sometimes engaging with state or within state institutions at the local all the way through the national level in order to change those institutions. And I think all of these um, institutional and organizational approaches involve their own dilemmas, right? If you're going to create parallel institutions, sometimes you advocate the existing institutions to the powers that be, and you might miss opportunities for more lasting, durable forms of change or, or a kind of broad outreach to a broader constituency. If you engage existing institutions, there's the possibility of co-optation or of limiting your horizons. But, you know, so I'm not trying to, I don't think either of us are trying to downplay the complexities of either um, inaugurating new institutions or um, uh, engaging with existing institutions, but populism is not an anti-institutional movement, right, or shouldn't be defined as such. I think populism actually has generated a complex array of, um, of, of institutional politics um, throughout its, you know, century and a half of, of existence. How is it, though, that populism's critics come to conflate democracy with institutions, with norms, with bipartisan comedy consensus cooperation? Where does that come from? Some of it, you know, has a, a very specific history within U.S. political science and within U.S. politics, which are closely connected to one another. Um, and, and Laura referred to this earlier. My understanding is that the initial sort of um, definition of of democracy as a set of institutions kind of dates or, or the American political order as comprised of a very specific set of norms and institutions dates to the 1930s. And it was an explicit contrast to the emergent totalitarian regimes in Europe. Um, and so that's one kind of origin point for it. And then in the 1950s, as um, Laura was also referring to, there's this uh, definition of democracy or of American democracy as pluralism or as polyarchy, which kind of means like something like the the competition between different interests within an institutional space. And that's what democracy is. So democracy is competing political parties, basically. Um, and and so and demo- Robert Dahl's early work is seminal here. Right? Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. And his definition, polyarchy, is still the way. I mean, I haven't uh, been in a, a graduate class for a few years, but just a few years ago when I was in graduate <laughs> school, that was the way that democracy was defined um, in an extremely and explicitly minimalist terms. And I think there's a couple of different things going on there, and I don't want to sort of simplify things too much. So one, one is um, a sort of contrast between a notion of what the American order is versus other political systems in the world. The other, as Laura already very nicely explained, is sort of distinguishing between American institutions and um, more um, radical transformative visions of democracy that might have a class politics inflection to them or might have a deeper popular sovereignty inflection to them. And that's explicit. Like if you read Dahl's work, he's explicitly contrasting it to those more expansive, muscular kind of visions of democracy. Um, So that's one set of things going on. And then the other is sort of more internal to to, uh, political science is this notion that it's easier to measure and compare democracy if you have a really minimal notion of it. Like the more parsimonious your definition of democracy is, the easier it is to measure it and the easier it is to measure across different systems how democratic are they. To reduce all these different features to data points. Exactly. And there's this kind of common sense understanding that it's impossible to measure popular sovereignty. And what we can measure are institutions um, or things like, you know, turnout or, you know, whatever it is. But if it's measurable and identifiable, then um, it makes for a better definition of democracy. So I think there's like the political kind of ideological pressure and then the disciplinary normative pressure tending towards these really anemic uh, definitions of, of what democracy is. And I just want to note one other thing, which is that lost in all of this and going back to amnesia is the fact that, you know, the founders of the U.S. Republic did not see it as a democracy. Not only did they not see it as democracy, they explicitly defined Republican rule against Democratic rule in some of the terms that Laura brought up earlier. So the notion that the U.S. is a democracy, that it's self-evidently one, and that what makes it a democracy is a particular set of norms of institutions that are first outlined in our Constitution is a very weird rendering of history that doesn't have 18th century origins. It has like interwar and then more approximately Cold War origins. That's absolutely right. That's that's where I was going to go. Is back to the founders, and it's quite telling, right, that the very um, early 
articulations of the things that became a system of constitutional checks and balances, procedures, um, kind of rationalizing of popular will or popular sovereignty pitted itself against democracy quite explicitly. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, very telling. Though even the the populist movement had this sort of rosy vision of of the founding that was contrary to the the early years of the public's reality. The the People's Party's Omaha platform adopted in 1892 states, quote, we seek to restore the government of the republic to the hands of the plain people with which class it originated. We also have Make America Great Again. The Tea Party's call to take back our country. On the left, we have a group that I'm a big fan of called Reclaim Philadelphia. And indeed, the mission statement of Our Revolution, the successor organization to the Bernie Sanders 2016 campaign, begins with a pledge to reclaim democracy for the working people of our country. Does populism always or at least typically tend to have a restorationist quality, particularly one that looks back to the founding, this appeal to returning things to the rightful order as they once stood? I think that's a really fascinating question that opens up to some of the tensions in populism and between right and left populism. As you were talking about the Omaha platform and their effort to kind of reclaim a founding that begins with the plain plain people, I was thinking of the ways in which they were contesting an origin story, right? Just as at the founding, there was a contestation over democracy, certainly between the Federalists and then the Anti-Federalists, which might have had that kind of Jeffersonian uh, notion of democracy, um, the people ruling, the farmers as the basis and backbone of democracy that the 19th century populists were refer- referring back to, right? Also to kind of earlier notions of radical republicanism that you saw during the revolution that got written out of state and certainly the federal constitutions, right? So there's often a, an appeal to the quote unquote quote, founding or founding moments to make a contestation over the story of what American democracy is. And I think you can make a claim that the 19th century populists were making uh, a claim to a kind of democracy that did begin with everyday people that did have a kind of Republican active participatory aspect to it, right, that, that, that then got written over. I think if you if you think back to that question, does does populism always have a kind of restorative moment? You can take it in two directions that kind of bring out the nuances of that. So on the one hand, you have the Tea Party and Trump going back to a Make America Great Again or um, the Tea Party's kind of appeal to a fundamentalist interpretation of the Constitution, right? A kind of fundamentalist, literalist interpretation of history in order to radically undermine the institutions of democracy that we have in the present, right? So they want to, you know, radically reduce uh, what government looks like, get rid of entire departments and, and you know, the Federal Reserve and these kinds of things, right? And Trump is also appealing to a kind of lost vision of democracy in, in order to profoundly undermine, even as he's also continuing some of the worst of liberal democratic institutions, right? But he's also leaving many inst- many of his agencies headless and, and, and kind of gutting them, right? So there's some ways in which you can look at a restoration um, that's a appealed to in a strategy of gutting, right, or, or, or changing. At the same time, you can look at some of the left uh, efforts to go back to a founding, some of which are quite aware of the, the bloodiness of the founding um, and, and, and the, the disavowals that have always been part of uh, a kind of never fulfilled American democracy. And you can think of them as doing something like appealing to what Sheldon Wolin calls a tradition of politicalness. Um, so Wolin talks about these restorative moments of democracy in which you go back to these moments in which the people people did emerge. And those are discontinuous moments, right? You see this in King's rhetoric, Absolutely. for example. You see it in King's rhetoric. Um, and you really can't have a movement that takes place in a country or a place that's not drawing from common language, which is always fraught, but you, you have to draw from a language that people speak. That's right. And at its best. And, and you draw from language that people speak and you and you uncover the, the the histories that have been written over by the dominant liberal narrative in order to inspirit transformation in the present. So if the right is going back to a kind of fundamentalist vision of history in order to wreak havoc on institutions in the present or or destroy the kind of democratic bases of, of, of uh, American democracy, then you can look at the left trying to restore these discontinuous moments in which people did emerge. And I think in answer to this question about needing to have some kind of common language, I think that's right. And yet, given the dangers in that, some of the 
the most exciting things in populist movements on the left are the ways they've allowed those to be contested, right? So if you look at the 19th century populists, they had this notion of commonwealth, right? Um, but that commonwealth was articulated in many different ways, right? Um, a commonwealth of a motherhood of the commonwealth, a commonwealth of, uh, of, of socialists, um, a commonwealth of uh, J- Jacob Coxey's army of cranks, tramps, and vagabonds, a commonwealth that would move out of the political oligarchy of, of centuries of slavery, right? And so there's even a con- contest over those those terms that 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 we can go back to. Uh, Thea, do you want to talk about this restorationist question? One one very interesting thing about this is that I I agree that in the U.S. context, uh, populist movements left and right have appealed to notions of the past, and they've done so towards different ends and in different ways, as as Laura just laid out. Um, there are sort of reactionary nostalgic versions of this that are more common on the right, but definitely do happen on the left as well. And then there's more emancipatory critical versions of this where invocations of the past are used to unsettle a narrative or to kind of uh, broaden the, the, the horizon or broaden the political constituency. What I think is interesting about this question, though, is how it um, works in Latin America, a region in which there are many left populisms, a long history of left populisms, I should say. And I don't see either in its more reactionary or or in its more potentially emancipatory, I don't see as much of the restorationist narrative to populism in Latin America. And my sense is that that's because it's so clear that for Latin American history, from conquest through early independence and these sort of oligarchic republics, um, it's so clear that Latin American republics or quote unquote democracies have been extremely exclusionary to the majority of the population since their inception, that populist leaders and populist movements have not tended to hearken back to an order that was better than the present, but have tended to be relatively future-oriented in terms of creating a new order that would finally be inclusionary. And so I think that's kind of an interesting difference between Latin America and the U.S., and it might potentially relate to the difference between sort of white settler colonialism and the Spanish form of imperialism, um, which was explicitly exclusionary towards the masses of uh, the multiracial masses that that existed in in the Americas. Um, So I'm not sure if that's the reason for the difference. And I don't think this means that Latin American left populisms don't involve invocations of everyday experience and language and narrative, but rather that they don't tend to look backwards. They tend to be more future-oriented or utopic um, because there isn't really a past to salvage. The conquest and the exclusion is too sort of close to the present turning a vision then back on the limits of a common language or a common history, even as it's being contested, it's difficult to find in U.S. populism's history or present real meaningful efforts to engage with indigenous narratives of colonialism. It's, 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 it's not something that I would comfortably put as a part of a left populist politics at this moment. Right. And one of the most interesting and I think often overlooked even among Latin American scholars of, of left populism, of contemporary left populism, of the sort of pink tide governments and the anti-neoliberal uprisings that, that led to them is the protagonist role of indigenous movements in Latin America in articulating broad visions of the people, right, which sort of totally upends some of our expectations based on, on U.S. history, for example. But but in the Latin American context, and I'm thinking especially in, in Ecuador and, and Bolivia, and I could, and I'm sure that there are other cases that this might apply to, indigenous movements, indigenous identified people played a key role in articulating broader coalitions that involved non-indigenous mestizo or non-indigenous identifying people. But but the idea that that an indigenous group would be at the forefront of articulating a broader conception of who the we are is not very familiar to us in the U.S., um, given um, what Laura just said, but but is certainly the case with um, uh, left populisms and, and left movements in Latin America. And this came up in a massive anti-mining march that you were on where there was a big debate over which flag should be in front, the Ecuadorian flag or the Wipfala, the indigenous flag. Right. And then there was also a third flag option, um, which which often made an appearance at the front, which was a plurinational Ecuadorian flag, like an Ecuadorian flag remade to have the rainbow colors representing plurinationality. And even the notion of plurinational, which is an indigenous concept from from Latin America, the idea that there are many nations within the nation, is a way that a that a left populism, that an emancipatory populism can be radically inclusive while not papering over difference. I'm Naomi Klein. You're listening to The Dig as well you should be, and you can support them on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at Patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has 
loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is The Common Wind, Afro-American Currents in the Age of the Haitian Revolution by Julius S. Scott, with a foreword by Marcus Redeker. The Common Wind is a gripping and colorful account of the intercontinental networks that tied together the free and enslaved masses of the New World. Having delved deep into the gray obscurity of official 18th century records in Spanish, English, and French, Julius Scott has written a powerful history from below. Scott follows the spread of rumors of emancipation and the people behind them, bringing to life the protagonists in the slave revolution. Though the common wind is credited with having, quote, opened up the black Atlantic with a rigor and a commitment to the power of written words, the manuscript remained unpublished for 32 years. Now, after receiving wide acclaim from leading historians of slavery in the New World, it has been published by Verso for the first time, with a foreword by the academic and author Marcus Redeker. The Common Wind, Afro-American Currents in the Age of the Haitian Revolution, by Julius S. Scott, with a foreword by Marcus Redeker. Out now from Verso Books. I'd like to talk more about language, which we just touched on a few questions back. Chantelle Mouf and her book, Four Left Populism, which you recently reviewed for N Plus One, Thea, she argues that relations of subordination simply reproduce themselves until a discourse problematizes them. And that discourse is wielded and introduced by a charismatic leader thus upsetting the regular and rotten order of things. You argue that this is a poor analysis of how power relationships actually get reproduced under capitalism and that it's a not very good reading of the political power of language either. Explain Mouffe's argument here, what she gets wrong, and how her approach to language leads her to wrongheaded conclusions about the role of leadership. Yeah, I I think her understanding of the way that discourse operates, both where it originates and how it gains salience, is intimately connected to a conception of populism that's very leader-centric. So in in Muth's book, uh, Four Left Populism, and, and just to for, for readers that are uh, readers, listeners that are less aware, uh, Chantal Mouffe is a Belgian political theorist with a long history on the left, kind of beginning in the Euro communist moment of the late 1970s and to our present populist moment that she's forcefully intervened in with a book in, in explicit uh, support of a left populist political strategy. Um, and so, she co authored uh, hegemony, hegemony and what? socialist strategy uh, uh, with the late um, her, uh, the the late political theorist and her uh, partner um, Ernesto Laclau. Mouf has a vision of I think it makes first to start with the leader centrism and then to go to the discourse. Um, Mouf has an understanding of populism that will be familiar to us from the liberal critiques of populism. Her vision of populism and what is one that centers a lot on the role of a leader. And what is important about a leader for Mouf and Laclau in their co-authored work and, and for Mouf in, in, in her work is the ability of a single leader with broad charismatic appeal that can speak in a language that resonates with the experience of many to kind of channel and route a lot of different people with a lot of different grievances into a political movement and channel their discontent and their political energies into a political force that can reshape the political train, right? And so you're going to hear some echoes of Gramsci, though I don't think Gramsci was at all leader-centric in this sense, but in terms of how you transform a political train, how you create hegemony, you're going to see echoes of Schmidt and the decisionism and the personalism that that Laura referred to earlier. Um, And so this is the vision of populism. And, And a leader can do this because many people in their isolated, alienated everyday lives can see themselves in a leader, right? So there's a kind of spectatorship, I think, dimension to this as well. And in addition to discourse, a leader uses affect, emotional appeal to really resonate with the the feelings of discontent that, that many ordinary people might have in an unequal and undemocratic political system. 
There are several problems with this, but I'm going to just focus on the the discourse piece because that's what you asked me about. In the book For Left Populism, Mouf talks quite a bit about how she sees discourse operating. And what she says is that relations of subordination or the people involved in relations of subordination. So just to make that in plainer English, like, you know, inequality in the workplace, right? The fact that you don't have autonomy over over your workplace and you're subjected to a boss, right? So in those relations of subordination, they just sort of continue every day and look the same every day and reproduce themselves every day unless somebody or something problematizes them, makes them seem problematic to the participants. And what she seems to assume implicitly is that the participants themselves, the workers in that situation, are not themselves going to see what's wrong with that, are not themselves going to see that they don't like the inequities or the interpersonal domination of the workplace. Rather, they need a leader to point out to them, this is wrong, this is bad, and all that like icky bad feeling that you have that you couldn't articulate, what's wrong with that is inequality, what's wrong with that is capitalism, what's wrong with that is the boss, right? But she says explicitly that these discourses that problematize relations of subordination and from outside of the relations that they describe, which I find to be a profoundly elitist understanding of how people formulate their um, grievances with the worlds that they live in and how they respond to uh, unequal situations of domination in which we are all enmeshed, right? Um, which is not to say that every single person is a social critic, but it is to say that many people know exactly what's wrong with work. It's that they don't have control over their workplace and they have to have a 15 minute break in order to use the bathroom and eat lunch and, you know, call their kids after, you know, a- after school. And it's, you know, in a in terrible situation. So most people know what's wrong. What they don't know is that they, along with others, have the collective capacity to change that situation, or that's what they might not know. So I think if we're thinking about, you know, why do relations of domination persist, I do not agree with Mouffe that it's because the people, the participants in them and those that are subordinated don't know that it's wrong to be subordinated, but rather that if they do know that it's wrong, they don't necessarily know that they could be part of a collective that transformed them. Their capacities have been alienated from them and they need to tap into them and regain those capacities. So I think I disagree with Moof in terms of, you know, whether people need to be enlightened to what the problems are in their lives or what the, you know, what 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 forms of realization they might need to go through in order to take political power. What can we learn about the answer to the question of how language functions from the late 19th century populist movement? You write critiquing Laclau's conception of language that contra Laclau's rarefied theory of populist discourse, populist identification required actors to draw on language that would resonate with the deep strata of the histories and everyday lives of disparate communities of working people. Populists revived and reworked several living traditions of rhetoric contained in America's populist imaginary to articulate both their critique of the corporate revolution and their positive visions of democracy. What What's Laclau's argument here? Is it similar to to the uh, one that Mouffe is putting forward that Thea was just critiquing? And how does your study of the populist movement contradict it or complicate it? So I think when I listen to Thea talk about Mouffe and uh, read her amazing uh, review, it strikes me that this idea of the leader and the reason that Mouffe is going to the leader is to fill in a problem that's part of the discursive theory of populism that Laclau and Mouffe put forward, right? Which is that populism is a discourse, an antagonistic discourse that pits the people against an enemy or an adversary. And that discourse brings together people who have disparate grievances, disparate demands and concerns, right? And yet when you think about the people we've been talking about thus far, right, the different groups that made up the People's Revolution of Bernie Sanders or Occupy um, and the ways in which it's so easy for some to be seen and some not to be seen, Laclau and Mouffe make it very clear that what unites a people or what brings them together is only what they call a negative logic of articulation. So the only thing that can bring together the disparate demands that might make up a people or a collective actor is the fact that their demands are equally unsatisfied, right? Now, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, For example, if you think about the pain and rage of the Movement for Black Lives activists, right, and the uh, kind of 
presumption of white innocence of some of the people in the audience that they um, that they called out, there is a very clear sense in which demands are not equally unsatisfied. And I think what Lacau and Mouffe know is that for a populist actor to take shape, right, there has to be, um, they call it a battle of hegemony, there has to be kind of one demand that comes to represent the voice of the whole. And oftentimes that becomes the leader, the kind of symbolic leader. Or you can even go back to that Schmidian conception, though that's certainly not what they're trying to do, in which there's an immediacy, an affective and rhetorical immediacy between the people and someone who can articulate their grievances. Now, Laclau is even less forthcoming on this than Mouf, but they don't spend a lot of time thinking about the role of affect and rhetoric and language and practice and institutions and organizing when they think about what makes up a populist movement. And so they don't really give us much to go on when we think about how populist movements and actors have have formed themselves, especially from the bottom up. They don't help us see the differences between how right and left visions of the people form. Um, They don't help us see how grassroots mobilizations take shape separately from, say, maybe top-down mobilizations. Right. So there's a very anemic view of what it looks like to actually mobilize uh, a people. And I think when you look at the 19th century populist movement, and one of the things I try to do is try to kind of fill in that positive vision and see how that people emerged. Right. Um, And part of it is going back to local spaces in which people are living in their everyday traditions, whether that's farmers alliances across the uh, South and Midwest who were rearticulating notions of kind of yeoman farmership or more modern modern notions of um, a kind of productive farming labor, Um, the languages of producerism. You can look at black uh, farmer co-ops who were bringing uh, black self-help traditions and associationalism. Um, You can look at the kind of Republican tradition or the socialist traditions of some of the union uh, movements that were part of populism, particularly the Knights of Labor. You can look at kind of a messianism that tries to disrupt the institutions and the powers that be that's been part of, uh, you know, the United States language and discourse. And those, those kind of messy amalgam of language made possible an emergence of a popular movement of people, the plain people, the producing people. You can also see within them the kind of contestation that was going on, right? Something that the kind of anemic uh, theories of populism doesn't allow us to see is how you had maybe a uh, rhetoric of resistance um, of the people against the elites that in some valences seemed like a kind of masculine, white uh, movement. And yet, on the other hand, you had a lot of space for contestation among that, in part because populism wasn't just rhetoric. It was located in local incubating experiments and institutions and cooperatives and different kinds of traditions of language and organizing right? that could really contest. And to kind of bring back to a point that Theo was making earlier, without that local location of populism in people's everyday practices and people's institutional experiments in their different languages and traditions of organizing, you're not going to be able to kind of contest the more hegemonic notions of the people that might emerge. Yeah. And and the sort of flip side of the way that McLeod move, which, again, for the uninitiated, these are sort of the theorists of populism that, that lots of folks um, um, draw on in scholarship on populism. Um, the kind of flip side of not attending to where streams of discourse and popular identifications come from or the in- organizational and institutional histories in which they're embedded that then leaders might draw on to greater or lesser degrees of success, right? So ignoring that history, the flip side of that is that once a leader is installed into power, there's very little sense of how that leader might continually in an ongoing way interact with movements that might hold them to account, that might contest um, decisions that they make, that might force them to broaden the the, the definition of the we or the forms that popular power takes, right? So not attending to where populist identifications and discourses and practices come from, uh, the flip side of that is that, you know, once the populist movement is in power, then what? How do we make sure that we keep it in an emancipatory direction and don't just consolidate around a leader? There's a great quote from the Farmers Alliance, which was one of the kind of main organs of the 19th century populist movement. And the Farmers Alliances had these, um, not only cooperatives, but they would meet in schoolhouses and churches and they would read uh, a little bit of Marxism. They'd, they'd kind of, you know, understand the kind of critical anti-capitalist theories of the day, right? They'd, they'd, they'd really be kind of theorizing, you know, in a way that when William Jennings Bryan, for example, takes over, you know, the, the, the kind of mantle of the People's Party, uh, you know, was, was far outside the realm of what he might imagine. So there's a great quote from the Alliance on this point that Theo makes, which is, 
Uh, the alliance needed to stand in relationship to the People's Party or its leader, as the Jacobin clubs of revolutionary France had stood in relation to the new democratic parliamentary government. The self-organized peoples of the alliance would serve as a mighty base of support for the populist candidates when they legislated democratically and a strong admonishing force when they did not. So there was this real sense among the 19th century populists, whether it was the Farmers Alliance, um, the Colored Farmers Alliance, the Knights of Labor, uh, feminists, socialists, others who were a part of this, that they were going to elect a party of the people and they were going to continue to mobilize, uh, you know, to, to keep it honest. Yeah, the, in, in your book, you write about all of these parallel institutions that the goal of which is to not only create these these new subjectivities, these new new peoples, but also over the long haul to ensure a, quote, permanently mobilized citizenry. Um, but you write that one key reason that the populist movement collapsed was because it moved into the electoral arena while demobilizing its movement. The Knights of Labor abandoned strikes, and the Farmers Alliance neglected these parallel institutions like cooperatives. And that brings up one of the points Theo was making much earlier in the conversation, was which is that there are, in some ways... Um, you know, tragic decisions, right, that, that under-resourced and subjugated peoples need to make, right? And the 19th century uh, populists moved into the political arena against what the Farmers Alliance wanted to do, against what many, what many unionists wanted to do, in part because they saw that their cooperative efforts were not going to survive at the local level unless they could make changes among the banks and the railroads and the factories who were cutting people out of the economy and politics. So they needed to make changes in currency. They needed to regulate uh, factories. They needed to reduce the power of banks to control legislature, right? And so they made that move and at the same time, ha you know, had to, in some senses, abandon some of the resources that they're putting into this cooperative movement. Um, perhaps they could have done that differently, but we also have to tell a story in which the power of rising capital was huge, right? And the power of under-resourced people needs to be savvy and, 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 and mobilize in response. So I think that's one, um, you know, of the key ways in which you see one of the key reasons for the decline of the populist movement. And I also think you can see that in con contemporary left politics, we might fall into, especially if you think of, say, Occupy, we might fall into a way of thinking about populism that isn't going to be attached to those real local sites of subject formation, of getting people to believe that they can be part of a collective effort, right, of naming and narrating visions. And so I think um, there's a lesson from those 19th century populists at their best for, for the kind of um, accountability politics uh, that, that Theo was talking about earlier. Yeah, there are often these presumptions in certain corner, quarters of the left of, of what a, a truly universal issue is or what a kind of revolution, who the revolutionary subject is. But one thing I, I took from your book and your description of how the populist movement was drawing on its context of the Third Great Awakening and its messianism to have these euphoric experiences that broke down the boundaries between individual selves to create these new collective identities is that revolutionary or any sort of political subjects really are never automatic. They always have to be made, albeit not in circumstances of people's own choosing. Right. They certainly don't predate uh, the the movement itself, right? And I think this is, in Marxist uh, language, is this a working class that somehow precedes the revolution or is this a working class that's formed as part of it, right? And I think you can look at Occupy and say that in, in their tent cities, they were trying to create alternative senses of what the people might be, what it might mean to have less, you know, either structuralist or less structured forms of governance, right? They were, they were experimenting at a very micro level with what that would look like. And at their best, they started to branch out and engage some of the local folks who'd been in the trenches in the cities they were in for, for, for decades. This happened in Boston. It was, it was tremendous in Oakland um, where you see the general strike and really try to think of what that might look like at a, you know, a little bit larger of a, 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 of a scale, right? And I think unless that, uh, unless that happens or until that happens, the people that we're thinking about might be either too micro or so generalized that it doesn't have a body. Yeah, one, one thing that I, that I think is really interesting about our current political moment is that 
you have on the one hand a lot of new organizational forms and forms of resistance and just salience of social protest and also kind of return of tools like the strike um, that had been sort of absent from our political landscape, at least in a mass scale, until recently, um, the resurgence of socialism, of radical immigrant rights organi- organizing, all, all of these kinds of movements percolating and experimenting with new organizational forms and tools of resistance. At the same time, and not unrelatedly, you also have a kind of crop of insurgent left candidates that have been elected at different levels of office. And what I'm both inspired about but also kind of concerned about is how exactly those various movements, which are still working out what their connection is to one another, like what's the relationship between DSA and labor or between striking teachers and the immigrant rights movement, right? There are, I think, amazing directions that could take and, and also frustrating or limiting directions that could take, right? So that's still being worked out on the ground. At the same time, um, how do you hold accountable uh, insurgent left and progressive candidates that have been elected in this ferment, right? Without, in some cases, long histories of, of, um, of organizational members or forms of accountability that have been practiced over time. Um, And again, I don't mean to say this in a pessimistic way. I don't think it's going to necessarily turn out badly, but I think we're in a moment where movements and leaders are being created in parallel streams at the same time. And it's unclear to me how those streams will be connected so that movements hold leaders accountable, but also so that leaders do the work of making the decisions they have to make to transform structures of power. At the and same this is time. another critique that you have of Move, if I remember correctly, that she argues that movements have to evolve into parties and basically does thus dissolve themselves into parties. Right. She sees the only way to affect political change is to become a political party and to contest on the electoral terrain with other political parties. I'm not against elections and I'm not against the formation of parties. I think that if you abdicate or sort of disavow all of the forms of movement building that need to happen alongside that, you get leaders or parties that are disarticulated from their bases and that will make decisions that are not in the interest of their bases, right? So I think she kind of neglects, as I was saying, the other side of the coin of um, once leaders get into power, how are they held accountable? Um, And she doesn't have a theory of how movements and parties might coexist in some way and mutually kind of feed one another. Looking at your book, Laura, it seems like the two rocky shoals that we have to steer the left-wing ship in between are on the one hand, electoral quietism that occupy... Uh, opted for. And on the other hand, the electoral co-optation that William Jennings Bryan's populist Democratic fusion candidacy of 1896 represented. I think that's absolutely right. Um, You know, I think there is something to Occupy that was was in many ways anti-statist, right? There was a kind of refusal to name demands, to recognize um, and engage. The acknowledge various, leadership. Acknowledge leadership and engage the very state that they mm. thought would continue the, you know, the the violences um, and structural harms, uh, you know, that, that we see today. Um, and there's something important to that. There's a whole politics of refusal coming out, right? It comes out of indigenous studies. It comes out of black radical, radical politics that there are in moments a need to refuse to engage the very state or to engage the state and its parties and its institutions on policies that are particularly harmful, right? Um, you know, you see this in the, the current carceral, uh, anti-carceral movements, right? Don't engage uh, in reform policies when they're going to grow prison beds or um, just transfer uh, folks from from jail to their homes under, under you know, e-carceration, right? And so there's an utterly important kind of notion of refusal that, 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 that they allow and that I think is part of many populist strategies as well, right? And yet, on the same time, um, that kind of real tensional policy about how to engage, uh, you know, you see this in the DCA, DSA, which I know, Theo, you know about much better than me, right? Um, whether to be engaging the Democratic Party to transform it, right? Because it's the vote we have. MOVE has a different kind of parliamentary democracy to engage. We have the Democratic Party here. Um, or to stay out of uh, electoral politics or to try to form another party, which would be incredibly difficult in, you know, in this contemporary moment in the United States, right? Um, I think that strategy of electoral politics or engaging the existing institutions is, is crucial, right? And yet that kind of space between um, refusal and reformism is one that has to be mined. Right. And and there's also ways that in addition to being kind of consistent features of the left, um, this debate, I should say, is a consistent feature of the left, like should we refuse, should we engage? It's also very shaped by its political moments of possibility, right? So I think when Occupy occurred, it didn't seem possible to really engage 
the party system or engage electoral politics in any way. And there was good re- reason for that pessimism, right, in terms of just a long history of repression, violent repression of the left, um, of um, weakening of the left, of demobilization of the left, of low union members, you know, all the things that we could get into about what the left looked like at that moment. And the prospects look a little bit different now, which opens up new questions, new possibilities, also new dilemmas and new dangers, right? But we're operating in a political context in which there seem to be more possibilities for engaging forms of ins- the formal institutions that, that exist. This is why I always resist being too down on Occupy, because Occupy had to happen in a way the way it did. Its limits were inevitable to its moments, and it had to end the way that it did. Like, Occupy could not continue as a permanent movement. It had to do what it did to allow what has happened since to happen. I think that's right. And and folks on the ground would acknowledge that, right? I mean, they would say, we, this tax bill was dead in the water at the local level until Occupy came around and started to imagine that we might need to put some money and resources behind people and, and you know, working class and other issues, right? And so I think, I think that's absolutely right, Dan. The most generous mainstream access assessment of popularity, we've talked about a lot of really ungenerous ones, uh, but this is a pretty bad one, even though it's generous, is that populism expresses dissatisfaction with real problems, but is poorly and irrationally expressed and thus presents the establishment with a challenge and an opportunity to decipher the people's true but garbled grievances, learn from its shortcomings, and diffuse the populist threat by becoming a better establishment 2.0. This is a dominant theme in Yasha Munk's book, for example. How is it that that populism comes to be defined as irrational, conspiratorial, and paranoiac? L- Laura, you, you suggest that the roots of this are in early histories of the capital P American populist movement, which read the entire movement through the figure of its co-optation, Williams Jenning, William Jennings Bryan. Is that where we should look? I think so. And I, I also want to get to the second part of that question as well. But the first part, you know, if you if you if you look at readings of 19th century populism, they existed in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But Richard Hofstadter really does play a huge role in uh, our understanding of populism as a paranoid style of politics. And it's his reading of the 19th century populist movement that sees it um, not just as something co-opted by William William Jennings Bryan, but also as something that was a reaction, right? He goes back to this yeoman farmer notion of Jefferson, the, you know, Jeffersonian democracy, um, these farmers couldn't stand their loss of their status in a modernizing, uh, you know, economy and politics. They were localist. They were anti-centralizing and the like, which completely misreads a, a, a populist movement that had their own kind of modernizing notions of what farming technology might look like, that had a vision of what the state might be, a vision of the state that left quite a few spaces for uh, populist movements and popular movements to, to kind of have that kind of um, uh, watchdog role, right? So he completely misreads it, but he links this, you know, this kind of reactionary populism to what he sees as a longer tradition of kind of conspiratorial theory and and reactionary politics uh, in the psyche of American political culture. And it's difficult to move out of that when the lion's share of what we read as populism are right-wing reactionary populisms. Um, so I think that there is a history in the United States context. I also think the notion of the people as a mob, as unstable, as fickle, that's been part of liberal theory um, from its inception, is another key reason that we kind of have this notion of the people as reactionary. There just isn't a trust that people can form their own institutions, their own parallel institutions, and organize collectively. And part of contrasting populism's emotionalism with the purported rationality of establishment politics is this contrasting of 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 populist Jeremy ads against the sober and wonkish policy and we saw this constantly in the 2016 primary but but Thea you've written that research on Latin America shows that transformative policies can't happen without a populist mobilizing strategy w- what do you make of this appeal to policy expertise being such a standard way to denigrate populist politics? And how should left politics conceive of this relationship between emotional affective mobilization on the one hand and governance and concrete system change on the other? Right. Well, I think that the kind of implicit denigration of the people as irrational and unruly and unthinking betrays the 
extremely anti-democratic, elitist core of all of these saviors of democracy, right? So Yasha Munk, and uh, we go after him a lot, and, and Dan and I wrote a critique of his book, um, but but also the Mark Lillas, but also the Peter Bonner, all, all of the sort of liberal establishment that we fer- referred to earlier kind of want it both ways. They want the legitimizing force of a p- shared popular identity without any of the elites giving up its control that that it might imply, right? So they want the legitimation of populism, but they don't want the transformation of populism. And I think that that puts them in an unstable bind that and is one of the many reasons that the center is losing its hold. It's an untenable position, but I see it as a just a, a reactionary kind of response to, to all of the grievances against the, the center that we're seeing now. To go back to, to your point about, about um, Latin America, Research that I've I've read and and also my own kind of qualitative historical um, uh, reading of of recent Latin American populisms, left populisms called the Pink Tide, and I'm not going to get into all of the complexity of the ascent and then re- retreat of of or recent retreat of the Pink Tide. But one key takeaway is that those governments were at their most transformative, their most muscular, their most able to undo um, elite power when they had a mobilized base and when they cultivated a mobilized base and didn't fear a mobilized base. And I do think in some of the cases, and I really do not want to generalize um, across such a diverse region, you do have left populist leaders that begin to bureaucratically entrench themselves and become um, wary of popular mobilization. And that suck some of their power and some of their transformative potential. So what this study that I that you're citing now um, shows is that it's when left populist leaders in their rhetoric appeal to the people and their grievances, but also within their political parties and those political parties' relationship to other organizations had kind of back and forth relationships with a base that they were able to undo the most of socioeconomic inequality. And that left leaders that weren't that didn't have a populist style and that also didn't have that relationship with the grassroots, even with similar policies, achieved less in terms of undoing uh, inequality. Dan, I just wanted to, to get back to the other part of your the lead oh, yeah. to your question, yeah. which is that this kind of generous reading, um, which you see in the media and you certainly see among some liberal scholars that what populist moments can show us is the symptoms of what might, might be wrong with democratic institutions, right? And so what leaders and parties need to do is to, you know, read that, listen to it, and then go about fixing them. Um, and that obscures... But the populist movements can't be the solution. They're just grunting They're towards them. They're just grunting, right? Yeah, yeah I like that. Um, that obscures the, the role of these establishment institutions in causing the problem, something we've been talking about, the, you know, uh, the, the whole time, right? Through economic policies that leave communities differentially, but in, across the board insecure, right, through uh, state and local policies that incentivize corporations to come uh, to their area, right, uh, rather than um, focus on where the jobs are going to go and, and, and how it's going to be redistributed, uh, that those resources to people at the bottom, carceral policy, policies that destroy uh, communities and create on the left and the right um, different kinds of uh, reactionary backlash. So you can't necessarily fix the thing when the thing is so endemic to, uh, to the establishment. One of the the biggest ironies of of this tendency to frame populism as irrational if understandable, an irrational if understandable sy- symptomatic expression of of systemic failures, is that these establishment readings tend to read the disaffection as very particularly coming from this certain vision of white working class. Men, what does it reveal the way that the establishment under threat ratifies precisely the conception of the people put forward by right wing populism? I mean, there's a there's a there's a kind of abstract answer to that in the ways in which we can think about liberal political theory as assuming a subject, even though it wants to say it's pluralistic or it's multicultural, right? And when liberalism uses, even at its most, you know, robust, uses norms like reasonableness and civility and the like. It's assuming a kind of white masculine subject that can then create as the alternative or create as the non-citizen subject the angry fill-in-the-blank woman, person of color, or the like, right? So there is a way in which even liberal theories assume a kind of white masculine subject and allow for 
anger among those who are most close to them, right, which is white working class men, right? There's a, there's a palatable, pal- palatability and effort to understand the kind of anger of white working class folks that um, is not as dismissive as the kind of anger we see from women and people of color mobilizing. That's not a fully satisfying answer. Um, I think... Because there's this weird way that even the liberal elite opponents of Sarah Palin, I think, instinctively agree with what she means when she describes a certain type of person as real Americans. Or the sympathy that you had when Barack Obama made that big faux pas um, when he went to, I forget where this was. Clinging to their guns. Pennsylvania, right, and talked about people clinging to their guns, their anti-immigrant sentiment and the like, um, and talking about a kind of base that uh, Democrats should be supporting and appealing to. And it's not very difficult to see, you know, when Hillary takes on her Annie Oakley campaign, it's not very difficult to see, you know, a Democratic Party that wants to see itself as the party of the working class reduce the working class to white men. Bernie did that in a quote where he says, you know, it's impossible to even think you could go on the street anymore and and ask Democrats, ask people if Democrats are the party of the working class. Um, You know, people would laugh at that, right? They wouldn't if you think about the working class as brown and immigrant and women and the like, right? But I think we're still kind of moving around the surface of the question. Yeah, there is also like a left iteration of this, which is in the kind of like norm core leftism that thinks that to like relate to working class people, uh, you know, you don't want to be talking too much about queer issues or like sending out organizers who have dyed hair or something as if like the working class are these like deeply normative individuals, which is a very empirically odd conception of the working class. Yeah, I think that this kind of portrayal of the working class as a kind of sliver of itself, which is actually its its smallest portion is white men, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the work, working class is disproportionately, or I sh- should say that people of color and women are disproportionately likely to be in the working class or to be working poor. And doing that, I think, al- allows one to sort of not reckon with the depth and variety of class, race, and gender subordination, right? So if you just see the working class as its white male figure, you don't really have to think about racial capitalism or think about the ways that immigrant status plays into economic insecurity or think about um, the gendered nature of social reproduction or all of the complexities of how class is lived. And you come away with a much less radical and and an emancipatory vision of, you know, who the subject, collective subject might be and also what they're trying to change about the existing order. It, you know, if it's if the working class is white male, they're kind of there's this idea that just giving them the little more that they think they deserve or making sure that their symbolic wage of whiteness is paid out and that's all we need to do to sort of keep the machine chugging along. Um, whereas if the working class is multiracial, if there are many genders and sexualities within it, if there's many types of um, citizenship status within it, we have to think a lot more deeply about what transforming capitalism might look like and not just appease a group within it. One thing that we've talked a bunch about but haven't really addressed head on yet is the figure of the leader in populism. Populism is so often conflated with demagoguery, personalistic and charismatic leadership, plebiscitary autocracy, not only by its critics, but as we've mentioned by advocates like Chantal Mouffe. Are these features inherent to populism or at least inherent possibilities? And if they're not, What explains this persistent association? So I don't think that they're inherent. I think the notion of populism as personalistic, as demagogic, as Caesarist, as attached to a charismatic leader comes out of liberal anxieties about Rousseau and Schmidt and the like, right? Where Rousseau can't fathom what it might be to have a kind of Republican, direct, popular system of governance without a figure of the, you know, the the great leader, right, or the uh, great legislator, right? And Schmidt associates democracy with this kind of immediacy. And I think that when you have liberal academics, uh, scholars, defining populism in that way, you get a kind of selection bias and then in which you then look at 
movements, you know, that either are personalistic or autocratic, or you find the moments of personalism and charisma and everything that you want to call populist, right? And you obscure everything we've been trying to call populist this whole time, which is a bottom-up grassroots kind of organizing that wants to hold its leaders accountable, right? And that, and that, that, that creates institutions and, and processes for trying to do so. So I think that's one of the, you know, one of the ways in which we don't have to see certainly um, the the kind of demagoguery story as being a part of populism or even the the strong leader as being a part of populism. I think in addition to that, though, it's it's interesting to think about something that populist movements are trying to do, which is to create a collective actor. And part of, you know, and to create a collective actor that certainly is insurgent, that has its anger, that has its affect, but that isn't a mob, right, that can rule itself. And, and that's difficult to do without forms of identification. So at the end of the day, even if we don't want to see populism as only identitarian, we want to see it as something built of practices and institutions, there also is this effort and problem of identification. And I think some of what we see on the left our efforts to think about identification, not through homogeneity, not through a leader, even with Bernie Sanders. It was sometimes Bernie Sanders and sometimes it was the people's revolution, but through these practices of, you know, relational and contested solidarity that Thea was talking about um, earlier. Well, and in fact, in Bernie's case, I think something that the mainstream commentators still don't get about his popularity is the way he was popular and is popular precisely because he's profoundly not charismatic mm-hmm. by any conventional standards and just talks about policy. Right. So he really is like a performance of an empty vessel in some way. I mean, not entirely. I read an interesting um, quote by Jackson Katz, I think is, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, about Bernie kind of, you know, having that kind of rough and tumble um he wasn't using the rough and tumble, but there, there was a kind of masculinist appeal yeah. that Bernie had. Like, he, yeah. you can imagine him in the street brawling for you, right? And it certainly his history and the civil rights movement sure. and other, and, you know, uh, allowed for that. So there is a kind of, you know, masculinity uh, to what Bernie allowed and, and the figure, you know, and even the kind of appeal to the glasses and the and the hair, right? There's a kind of iconoclasm to, to Bernie that, that people were attached to. And yet, I think you're absolutely right. Bernie many times tried to move away from his policy, his background. He didn't want to talk about his background. He wanted to talk about his policies, and he won't right? Ki- he won't kiss your baby. And you won't kiss your baby. Yeah. Right. It. <laughs> right. Um, I think an, an additional issue with, you know, is is the leader kind of an inherent problem within populism and what's the relationship between that and all the liberal figurations and anxieties about demagoguery? Um, I think one, one thing I'd like to do is sort of kind of drive a wedge between the leader as a single individual and leadership as a dis- as a kind of distributed quality of a movement, right? So within within any movement or especially a coalition of movements, you need multiple leaders at different scales, um, kind of galvanizing people, um, mobilizing them, um, resonating with, with ordinary experience and coming out of that ordinary experience themselves. And I think that's something the left should absolutely not only be comfortable with, but be cultivating actively. Like making people into leaders is the way that we regain our collective capacity. Um, that isn't the same thing as pinning our hopes on a single leader. And knowing that, you know, if one of those many leaders kind of gets into a position of office, um, they're not the only one. There are folks to replace them when their term is up, right? So thinking about populism... Especially, let's say, if they get elected president at a rather advanced stage. At a rather advanced stage, right? <laughs> so if, if, you know, thinking about leadership as something that you're cultivating in an ongoing matter in an ongoing manner, and then how that connects movements to electoral politics is the type of forward-looking complexity that we need if we're going to use electoral politics to transform the social order. Part of what was so exciting in 2008 was when Marshall Gans is is organizing Obama's ground game, right? And there really was this effort to Marshall Gans, organizer with the Farm Workers Union um, and the guru of Obama's ground game. He, he has a, a deep history and practice and theory in thinking about uh, movement organizing, right? Um, including uh, the kind of theory of leaderfulness that, that, that Thea is talking about. And it was exciting to see Gans in that role um, and a, a ground game that was trying to, uh, in part of what it was doing, to mobilize those capacities of leadership in people, right? And so, you know, I think what we're talking about somewhat differently is the building of leadership from the bottom up, right? That that, that kind of comes together and coalesces in a, in a coalition of leaderful movements that then can, you know, ignite a Sanders run and, and hold it accountable. Um, the Obama campaign certainly did not create did not a that. permanently mobilized No, scenario. no, not at all. But what, so, but the, I did want to ask this, this question though, what was Obama a uh, populist, because you know, popul- popu- the left and right populists get all of 
this bad rap for being so personalistic. But Obama, that Shepard Fairey image of him with like hope and change, I mean, un- unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime in the United, had seen in my lifetime in the U.S. And I mean, that that's the personalistic part. But the populist part, it seems to me, would be just the way he appealed to a certain conception of the American people as overcoming their differences to form a unity that would heal the wounds of the Bush years. And we're seeing something similar along similar lines, I think, right now with some of the centrist establishment 2020 Democratic hopefuls who I think are definitely be talking about bringing America together to rise above Trump's vulgarity and to return to our best true selves. What was so was Obama populist and in, in our Will his successors in Beto and Kamala Harris iterations be populists in a way as well? So I think um, when you talk about Obama and the personalism, I remember reading an article about how Obama was so much like Bush, actually. People wanted to touch them. And there was, you know, Bush was the kind of, uh, you know, he used a sort of folksy populist rhetoric that imagined a people not quite like Palin's Real America, but something more like that um, in response to the Clinton years, uh, just as Obama's, uh, you know, uh, creating this alternative. Francisco Peniza has this notion um, of a populist intervention to remind us that I don't know that anyone is populist. I don't think a leader or a party or a movement or an actor is populist. I think that if we think of populism as a rhetorical, discursive, and political strategy, it's something that can get picked up by different actors um, across the political spectrum as one strategy among many to build identification and collective action. And I think in that respect, Obama certainly did appeal to uh, a people um, through an antagonistic language, right? Um, Yes, we can. Change we can believe in. He articulated that people in his race speech, his vision of it, right? Um, And so I think there really was this this kind of notion of um, a multicultural or pluralist people uh, that Obama had. Yeah, what's interesting about Obama is that he definitely... uh, deployed populist techniques and strategies as you're as you're pointing out and did as Dan kind of said have this expansive notion of the people the we what's interesting about it is that it departs from populism in a way is cuz there's not a clear enemy, right? I mean, there we could get into the weeds and think about who's excluded from his notion of the we, but, but on the surface level, there wasn't a clear enemy. What the people were defined against was anything that could divide the people. So in a way, it's sort of like the enemy is enmity, like the enemy is antagonism. Um, the enemy is friction. Um, that's what we want to avoid. Um, but it's not personalized into the figure of the 1% or the immigrant other, or, you know, the welfare queen, or the dependent, um, non-taxpayer, all these other kind of figurations of the enemies that other kind of more uh, fully fleshed out populisms have deployed. The enemy is that gloomy feeling we all had at the end of the Bush, by the end of Bush's second term. Right, in Guantanamo, right? And yet, you know, Obama couldn't create that enemy because he still had to act as a neoliberal president who kept the militarism of the Bush years alive. Right, which shows the limitations of any political strategy to confront these crises that doesn't actually articulate an enemy. Laura, one of your more unorthodox arguments about populism is that Undocu Queer, which organizes undocumented queer people, constitutes a populist movement. This raises a question that we've touched on a few times already, and that goes back to the Combahee River Collective, which is how is it that groups at the margins can do populist politics, given that people tend to think of populism as something that requires a massive or even super majoritarian collective we. And it also poses a related question, which is if and how the people can be defined beyond the confines of the nation when what we are battling for, at least in part, is control of the nation state. So this is sort of like the where do we go from here question. Yeah, I'm going to dive in even though the question was aimed at at Lauren, then she can pick up um, what she wants to add. Um, I think one way to think through the ways that marginalized groups might Um, have a central role in actually articulating broader political coalitions. And I believe that they do. And this kind of goes back to my comment about the role of indigenous people in articulating a broad sense of who the Pueblo, who the people are in Latin America, is to go back to actually Combahee's River's key insight, which is the Combahee River Statement's key insight, which is that the fact of multiple oppression actually situates groups like black women who are socialists to actually connect multiple disparate groups together. So I think that the unique political power of multiply marginalized populations is actually that they can articulate how systems of oppressions interact and help to join together a broader coalition of the oppressed. 
I think that's fantastic. Since there's so little time, it's difficult to make an argument about UndocuQueer, which, um, if folks listening the book. don't know, um, was the kind of radicalization of the DREAM Act movement, right? And what I tried to do in that case was think about it as a limit case for populism, right? Um, which can bring together that effort to kind of create a mass and broader scale resistance movement, right? While at the same time, do more than or than Bernie and Occupy to look slantwise towards folks who are at the margins, right? And so I think quite a lot of what Thea is saying about looking at people who have m- m- multiple experiences of marginalization and subordination, subordination, having a vision of what popular resistance needs to be, comes out of the politics of the undocumented youth movement. Um, I think just to kind of think about what I find exciting about the movement is the way they tacked back and forth between uh, policies that engage state and federal, or strategies that engage state and federal policy, that engage language of the the dream act a vision of what the american nation would be right or we are all human right a vision of what humanity would be on the one hand and then on the other hand strategies that were cross border that looked to the margins um, that refused to obscure the people who are always at the margins of populist movements and i think that tacking back and forth is the kind of thing that left populist movements are going to have to continue to try to do well lara gradin and theoria francos thank you very much thank you thank you dan Laura Gradin is a professor of political science at Wellesley College and the author of Populism's Power, Radical Grassroots Democracy in America from Oxford University Press. Thea N. Riofrancos is a professor of political science at Providence College and the author of Resource Radicals from Petronationalism to Post-Extractivism in Ecuador, forthcoming from Duke University Press. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said after remarking that, it is evident that all forms of the state have democracy for their truth and, for that reason, are false to the extent that they are not democracy. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week, sometimes once, sometimes twice. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinator is Logan Dreher. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio, and please do find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. If it's on iTunes, please leave us a nice review. Those reviews help put us in touch with new listeners. What also does that is you telling other people about the existence and excellence of this podcast. Please make propaganda for us and do find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to keep this show up and running strong even a few bucks is huge